I'm not saying this, but I mean, I think throughout listening to you and the procession of the call, I think that there were a few things that you said were wrong. Cool. Um, even by your own account. And then I have an argument that I kind of want to get to. Okay. okay. What was I wrong about? Um, okay. So the first thing you said is, I wrote it down because I thought it was a bizarre thing to say. It said, you can't point to an actual theist who's called the show, this show, uh, with a reasonable evidence-based argument for the existence of God. Correct. If you can, it would be the, uh, the one and only argument that would keep coming up. That's it would win the Templeton Prize, the Nobel Prize. I think it would, it would win those prizes, but I, I was probably a little hyperbolic in saying it was the only argument that would come up. Uh, well, I mean, I just think that just strikes me as uh, an argumentum ad populum. You know, like, I mean, why, why couldn't it be the case that there could be an argument that is good, that you don't understand is good, and that, in fact, no one understands is good, or, in fact, some people understand it's good, but when they try to convince people, the people who are giving out prizes don't understand it. I don't understand the reasoning there. Yeah, it's not an argument ad populum, because I'm not the truth of this is based on any sort of popularity of this. All I'm have yet to be presented with an argument that is evidence-based and demonstrably sound. And if there was something that was demonstrably sound in, in the way uh, of all the other things, we wouldn't be having these debates for thousands of years. Your, your view that perhaps there's an argument that is truly sound, that people just aren't aware that they're sound, um, is self-refuting because soundness well, is about uh, recognition. Well, one thing that, no, well, that's not true actually. So soundness is a property of arguments such that if the, uh, if the argument is in valid logical form and the premises are true, then the, argu then the conclusion... So the argument is you're sound. confusing it a little bit. Validity is about the structure of the argument such that well, true premises so lead to true true. conclusions, and if that is the case for the structure, of the, the structure of the syllogism, it's valid. Soundness addresses whether or not the premises are actually true and or accepted. Because the point is, in argumentation, if you accept the sky is blue, whether it's blue or not, if you accept that premise and the structure is, is valid and you accept the second premise, you must either accept the conclusion or you are in violation of logical reason. Well, you're just, well, that's a weird way to define soundness because... <laughs> that's actually the definition of soundness. Uh, well, let me, let me explain. I gave the definition of soundness is that the premises are true and then Matt Dillahunty gave the definition of soundness that people accept the premises, but that means that there are all sorts of sound arguments, right? Because there are people so who accept. So I'm talking about. I'm talking about two different. I'm, Derek, I'm talking about two different things. Yes, soundness is about whether or not the premises are true. But as I said, in argumentation, if there is someone who is convinced that a premise is true, convinced that both premises in a syllogism are true, and they want to reject the conclusion. If the structure is valid, they are now in violation of sound reasoning. That's what I said. Right. So I agree that that's irrational. But what I'm saying is that you can't. When you said it was sound, you were saying that if there was a sound argument, then something like everyone would accept it or something along those lines, right? And I'm saying that that's not true. No, no, no. You have an argument that's logically valid. That's. Uh, I'm talking about whether or not it's demonstrably history. sound. Not, so you, you could start with premise one, there's a diamond the size of my fist uh, hidden under the, a rock on Mars. That can be true and we'll never have access or we, it's unlikely we would ever have access to be able to demonstrate that it's true. But if somebody was convinced that that was the case, that would be a different issue. Well, so demonstrably sound, you're just saying that they can demonstrate the truth of the premises. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Right, so, I mean, so, um, so the, the premises themselves are the demonstration of the conclusion, right? And then you have layers upon layers. I mean, you're going you're gonna to go on. Uh, I mean, obviously, the infinite skeptic can just keep going on, and then you're never going to have any sound arguments. So, because you're not going to be able to demonstrate Sure, but that's not a skeptic, skeptic, and it's a slur to phrase it that way. That's not what skepticism is. Um, but yes, somebody that is flatly going to deny things and, and get right down to questioning the fabric of reality, yes, they can deny premises until the cows come home, whether there are cows or not. My, my, maybe, maybe this rephrasing will help. 
I am not aware of any argument that's ever been presented on the show for the existence of a God that is both valid in structure and has demonstrably sound premises. Right, and so, again, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, like, um, take the evolutionary argument against naturalism, right? Okay. So, I mean, I presume that you're a naturalist. I don't know if you're agnostic about that or not. I, I'm not a philosophical naturalist. I'm a uh, methodological naturalist. Okay. Um, so, methodological naturalism, as I understand it, is that we're not going to incorporate any intentional explanations into our uh, into our scientific framework. Is that the idea? It is the recognition that because we cannot demonstrate non-natural causation, that we don't get to appeal to it. Well, I mean, I guess this is sort of a this is sort of tangential, but what? I mean, like, take something like, um, you said that there would be someone winning Templeton Prizes. I mean, do you think that there are no good, uh, well, I mean, one thing is that Alvin Plantinga in 2017 won the Templeton Prize, right? But, I mean, I don't know if you think that that's evidence for theism or something like that. No. Uh, I obviously don't think it's evidence for theism, but it just seems like that's evidence that his arguments for theism are good or demonstrably sound. No, I probably shouldn't have referenced the Templeton Prize because the fact that they think it's the case doesn't mean it's the case. Um, but the, right, in, but in, I mean, in, in a sense, what I was essentially saying is if there was a, a recognizable, valid and sound argument for the existence of God, uh, we wouldn't keep having these discussions and debates. And it'd be front page news, it'd be, you know, Nobel worthy, et cetera, that somebody had essentially demonstrated the truth of that, that a God exists. Do you have right, a, that, a valid and sound uh, argument? Well, I want, I want, hold on a sec. I want, I want justification for that claim. If there were a valid and sound argument, we would expect it in the newspapers, well, all that stuff. Yada, I, yada, I yada. would I just, justification I, I'm, I would just like a valid and sound argument here. Yeah, I, I, mostly I'd love for somebody to actually present an argument rather than tiptoeing around all this other stuff. But I, I don't know what to tell you, Derek. If you think that somebody could actually come up with a, a proper, valid and sound argument for the existence of God and this would not hit the news, I don't know what to tell you. <clears throat> well, I, so, okay, so you just believe that claim. Right. I yes, I am convinced yes. that if somebody could prove there was a God, we would hear about it in the news and from organizations that are intent on doing this. I think that the motivations of people, countless theists surrounding the globe, if they finally could present a valid and sound argument for the existence of their God, I think we would hear about that. And instead, what we hear, instead of hearing that argument, what we hear are countless other arguments have been trotted out over years that don't do the case. You've got Bill Craig doing the Kalam cosmological argument, which doesn't have God in any premise or the conclusion. And that's being trotted out as if it's evidence for the existence or an argument for the existence of God. So why is it that the greatest apologists on the planet aren't actually using these arguments if in fact they exist? That is my, my thing. That's not an appeal to popularity. Um, if in fact there were good arguments for God, why aren't the best apologists using them? Well, they might be. You just might not accept them, and those yeah. good arguments might not be in the news. So yes. I'm just saying that the claim that you're... This is the argumentum ad, ad, argumentum no, ad stubbornness or argumentum ad idiot. No, I'm ask, no, you, no, you made a claim, right? You made a claim. That claim was that any good argument is going to be in the news or something like that, right? Yes, that is I'm what I'm convinced I'm is likely the case. That claim. I, I, right, but why? I mean, we, we be, regularly, how many times have we found news, Noah's Ark and that's in the news? Well, let me, I mean, let me, let me, all right, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that there are any good arguments for materialism? I don't know how that's relevant. And I have already pointed out that I'm not a philosophical materialist. Well, I'll explain how it's, I'm not predicating you with any position. I'll explain how it's relevant if you just like to answer the question. I, I am not convinced. Here, here's the, here's the easy answer to your distraction. I am not convinced that there are sound arguments for hard materialism. That's why I'm not a materialist. Right, so, right, so do you think that uh, there are no good arguments for moral realism? What does that have to do with this? I mean, all I need to do to falsify his hypothesis is find something that he thinks there are good arguments for that is not published in the news, right? Because that's the criterion for falsification, presumably? No. No, and see, that seems to be backwards because my point is that 
all the bad arguments are out there, and there are good arguments for things that are out there, but I'm unaware of any good arguments for things that aren't out there. And Look, given that there are a bunch of people, saying, given that there are a bunch of people who are constantly working on this and have a vested interest in convincing people, one would presume, not assert with certainty, that if in fact there was a valid and sound argument for the existence of God, we would be aware of it. If it exists among humans, we would be aware of it because somebody would share it, right? And it would be pointed out by apologists left and right. Here it is. Here's the one we've been looking for so that we don't have to trot right, out the claw. But what I'm saying, the reason I was drawing an analogy to something like materialism is because there may be valid and sound arguments for materialism. There may be valid and sound arguments uh, for other metaphysical hypotheses. But the point is, is that um, just because people, that doesn't mean that uh, people aren't going to disagree with them. In fact, it doesn't mean that- I didn't say anything. I didn't, I was not talking about whether or not people agree or disagree. I was talking about awareness. And, and I would argue that if there is a logical, valid, and sound argument for something uh, of, of any note, that if we're not aware of it, it doesn't exist. Well, I mean, I'm saying there might be sound arguments that exist now that aren't popular. Sure. So do you have one? Do you have one? Uh, well, we could talk about that. I just, as long as you're in agreement with me, then I think that what you said, you disagree with what you said previously in the show. I'm saying, so is it possible that there's a sound argument that we're not aware of? Is that what you're getting no, no, to? We are aware. No, I'm saying that, well, maybe not you specifically, but one of the arguments that you have with this sound and that you just are mistaken somewhere along the line. Sure. And in fact, a lot not at all likely that we would expect that everyone would be able to understand. I didn't say everyone, but I'm not an idiot and I've studied this for my entire life. All right. Um, well, another thing I guess I wanted to talk about... Is nothing. Um, do you have an argument for the existence of God? That. Well, I do. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit confused about one thing that you said in regards to the call with the, uh, the previous caller. So I think that you're using sort of an idiosyncratic definition of objective morality. Because the way I understand it is that objective morality is what one ought to do, full stop. That is irrespective of... Uh, the beliefs and desires and aims of agents, but you seem to reject that notion, right? Like, I'm not sure what you, because that's the way objective morality is sort of standardly used. And so you're, you're using sort of an idiosyncratic definition. I just want to make sure by objective morality, you mean um, as long as the goal is X, one ought to do X, and that's Correct. As morality. I said 35 times in the previous call and over the many years that I've discussed this, I, I go into great detail that what I'm talking about is situational ethics, that what I'm talking about is once you have, a, have decided and agreed upon a goal, that there are objective assessments that can be made or non-subjective assessments that can be made with respect to that goal, that's it. Okay, so I, I just- What you seem to be, what you seem to be doing is suggesting that what I'm, that, that there's an objective moral reference that is in fact more akin to what I would call absolute morality. And I have strived for years to point out the difference between absolute morality and an objective moral system. Uh, well, I think that God is co-intentional with the good. Um, and that, I mean, I guess that takes a lot of explaining, but I think what, and so I think that the good, I actually believe in objective morality. And I think that the good is what one ought to do uh, full stop, but I'm a sort of constructivist in that I think that there's a way in which agents can be constructed such that there's a correct and incorrect way to perceive motivating properties. But that's all, um, I mean, that's all, that's, it would take a long time to get into. Yeah, and basically so, uh, you said the same thing the, the last caller did, that God and good are, are co-equal. Co-intentional. Co sure. That's what I said. Right, um, so I, I mean, I can explain that view, but I, I just kind of wanted to get I just want to make sure, insofar as the standard sort of definitions go, you're not a moral realist, right? You're a moral well, anti-realist. What is your standard definition of moral realist? Because what I've said repeatedly is that re the, the physical facts about reality are the foundation 
by which you determine whether or not your outcomes are consistent with well-being as a foundation. That's it. Right, but 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 what one ought to do. So, like, I'm, what I want to do is say you don't think that your notion of morality is detached from what one should or shouldn't do, do you? Or is it completely detached from what one should or shouldn't do? No, provided that we agree on well-being as a goal, there are things one should and shouldn't do. Right, so, but if someone has alternative goals, presumably they should do those too, right? Yes, if you're playing chess and you have a goal of not winning, then there are things that you should do. But I prefer right, to play so, chess with the people who care about winning, and I prefer to live life with the people who care about living. So it seems, so like what morality is then to you? Is, I don't care if it's like morality. I, as I've said over and over again, including there in that call, I don't care if you call it morality or if anybody calls it morality. I'm talking about well-being. You either care about well-being or you don't. But what I would like to know from somebody who, who, who wants to say that well-being isn't morality, okay, what is there about morality that is true and useful that isn't encompassed by well-being? Because nobody's been able to answer that yet. Well, I think that what you're doing there is that you're taking an extension of morality um, that which is that it's well-being and saying that it's reducible to the other, which is which is not true, I don't think. I mean, I don't even think that you would assent to that. It, you, it, it just happens to be that what's coexistent. You just keep telling me what you think and you won't say why. And the why is what I care about. Well, I'm about. just trying to, I'm sort of just figuring out your position right now because I... Well, you um, chewed up a well, bunch of time well, here, and we've got think. four minutes left. Yeah, we, we've we spent a bunch of time getting me to repeat things. Right, but I, I'm, like I said, I'm just trying to get a good handle on your position because you use a lot of idiosyncratic language, and I, I think that you not being careful with as much experience as you have is detrimental to your cause, right? Because I, it was like oh, I was so you oh. called because you're concerned about how detrimental I am to my cause. That's so well, I'm sweet. Concerned about rationality. I'm concerned about rationality, and I think that if you're doing things that are detrimental to your cause, that's irrational. If you and I agree that we want to win a game of chess, do you agree that we can derive ought moves and, and valuations of position with respect to that goal? Yeah, I think that... Yeah. Um, well, so I think that... If you I and I agree on well-being... Oughts are reducible. If you and I agree on well-being, do you not think that we can der derive the same sort of right moves, wrong moves from that? Yeah, I think that if well-being is a goal, then there are things that conduce to well-being and things that do not sure. conduce to well-being. So, so you and I are in agreement, and yet you're concerned that I'm not being rational or doing damage to my position. Well, you keep calling it objective morality. No, 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 no. I have not. Okay, so you don't. I've spent years correcting the people like you who have this view of objective morality, which I think is really probably better described as absolute. I've specifically said over and over, including this call, exactly what I'm talking about when I say that morality is objective, that there are non-subjective evaluations of consequences of actions with respect to a goal. And if you have some other usage of that, that's clearly not what I'm talking about. Right. But that's but that's why that's when I asked you no. that, it's, that your notion of morality is detached from what one ought do, and that's true. No, that's true because of what you no. said, right? You said, <sighs> "Oh my that God, morality goodbye." Has... We have like a minute left, and I'm not going to get to hear a valid and sound argument for God today. It's just so. Here's the thing. I talk a lot. <laughs> I run around the world educating people about skepticism, about morality, about atheism, uh, about reason. And one of the things, you know, I don't claim any expertise on anything. If there's anything I'm good at, it's taking complex topics and making them easy to understand because that's what I do for me. Uh, the fact that I'm not using, in every case, the specific language that somebody else is using shouldn't be a problem if when I'm talking a lot, I clearly say, Here's what I'm saying, and here's what I mean. If all mean thing I'd ever done is come in and say, I advocate for objective morality, bam, then you might have a point. But as I've been on here for years, a decade, offering monumental amounts of clarity with regard to what I'm saying, and you call to say, 
So let me see if I understand you. You have an idiosyncratic view of this that's probably, yeah, clearly it was clear enough for you to understand this. And then you pretend like, oh, well, I'm just worried that, you know, about rationality and about whether or not you're hurting your cause. Bullshit. You are not at all concerned about whether or not I'm hurting my cause. You are looking to either trap me in some sort of, oh, Matt's a dilettante who's not particularly, hey, big, Matt's bald, has a gray beard, he's a dilettante who didn't take any philosophy classes, who's self-taught, and yet somehow or another, I still got you to call me. <laughs> And I missed my opportunity to hear the valid sound argument for the existence of a God. Yeah. Derek, you could have been my salvation today. Wouldn't that have been more important? Uh, you know. Our eternal souls are on your head because you That's, wanted to be a pedant. Yeah.